Thank you all for joining us here this evening. My name is Tom Flynn, and on behalf of the Sunnybrook Board, I would like to welcome all of you to tonight's session. Our practice at the hospital is to try to have board members welcome people to these events, and I'm happy to do that with you here tonight. And I'll also say that I'm here as a member of the community, given a health issue that a member of my family has in this area. And so I'm here in those two capacities tonight. A couple of administrative things just to note off the top. Uh, firstly, this is the last of our spring lecture series, and we'll be taking a break for the holidays and resuming in September. And if you are not yet on our mailing list, please consider adding your name to ensure that you receive alerts on the fall topics that will be coming up. So sign up on the internet if you'd like to get those emails. And as we head into the warmer months, and I will say driving up, it was 31 degrees in my car, uh, many minds turn to protecting our skin, which is the body's largest organ, as you would know. Um, and a few statistics related to the skin. Uh, the Canadian Dermatology Association reports that 20% of Canadians live with acne. One million Canadians have been diagnosed with psoriasis, and that's just to name a couple of the more common conditions. And so tonight we have a very experienced and expert panel to lead us through a discussion on this topic. And leading tonight's discussion is Dr. Neil Shear, who is up here on the stage with me. Dr. Shear is the head of Sunnybrook's Department of Dermatology. He was the director of the University of Toronto's Dermatology Division for 16 years and retired from that position earlier this year. Dr. Shear was also the former director of clinical pharmacology at the university for nine years. His main area of research is in severe drug reactions, but he has wide interest in the field of medical dermatology, and he has also published more than 350 peer-reviewed publications, which is an incredible number. Uh, Dr. Shear is also uh, busy. Over the last year or so, he has uh, given talks like this in a number of cities, including in Tokyo, Saudi Arabia, Cairo, India, and he'll be in Vietnam next week. So although he's a member of our community here in Toronto, his reputation extends far beyond, and we're lucky to have him here tonight. Dr. Shear, the podium is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hope you don't have to show any slides because uh, we keep getting these warning signs. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. It was very kind of you to take the time to uh, come here and your commitment uh, to Sunnybrook and uh, especially to our program. Uh, I want to thank everybody who is here uh, for coming. Uh, really look forward to this uh, experience of speaking to the community that are interested, uh, sometimes for personal reasons, sometimes out of interest, and sometimes just as a social outing. Uh, our lecture tonight is called Skin... Pro oh, I should mention by the people who are watching uh, who are from the webcast, uh, welcome to you as well. Uh, I hope it's cooler where you are. Uh, our lecture tonight is called uh, Skin Problems and Fixes. So it's nice to talk about the problems, but let's talk about how we can fix things. People have been asking uh, for this, and uh, we're very pleased to have a good lineup tonight, a very special lineup. Kusi Pon, uh, who will uh, int we'll introduce her fully later, will be discussing uh, laser therapy and whether it's an option you might consider for something, but people ask a lot about laser therapy in the clinic, and we're very happy and glad that she's here and also that she does do it for our patients. Uh, Laurie Shapiro is going to follow that with a discussion about adverse drug reactions. Dermatologists see a lot of drug reactions, and we're actually experts in the area of reactions to drugs, and uh, Dr. Shapiro is uh, one of the world experts and an author of many chapters on it, so she's gonna talk about it. And then Dr. Brittany Waller, who's been uh, one of our residents and uh, working with us the past year, uh, is going to talk about everyday common skin issues, things that come up all the time, things that might be relevant to you. Uh, Dr. Perla Lansing was supposed to be here, uh, but she could not, and I'm very grateful that Dr. Waller was willing to step in. Uh, we're going to have time in the evening for questions, and there are white cards here. These are not to write down recipes. Uh, as tempting as that may be, there are actually uh, questions, um, and they can be earth-shattering, like what can be done about enlarged pores, uh, or they could be political, whatever you want. All I ask is, if you're, uh, if you're a physician, maybe have somebody else write it for you. But, but if you're not, then uh, I'm sure we'll be able to read it. So that'll be helpful. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, write the questions, we'll collect them. It's a nice way to see what people are really thinking. 
And uh, actually, I'll come down, and our volunteers will be walking through uh, between talks also to uh, capture uh, the questions and cards. If you need to get up during the evening, feel free to do so. We're not going to have a formal break. Um, as you may well know, if you scope this out, the bathrooms are to the left as you go outside. Women are on the left side here, and the men are more on the right. Uh, so uh, there are signs that will show you who goes where. Uh, so that'll be, uh, that'll be helpful. And I guess right now, um, I suppose we should get to the actual lectures. Uh, so the first lecturer is uh, Dr. Kusi Pon. And Kusi's an assistant professor in the Division of Dermatology here. She's director of fellowship education at Cosmetic and Laser Dermatology and director of postgraduate cosmetic dermatology at the University of Toronto. Uh, she's an expert in all these various devices and treatments uh, for uh, improving and enhancing uh, appearance. And it can come in many different ways. And Dr. Pond's going to talk about it. So Kusi, uh, come on up. And uh, we'll go from there. Oh, lights go down. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to participate this evening. Yes. Yes. That's okay. Thank you. Perfect. So this evening I'm going to talk about lasers and the lasers that we use in dermatology. And these are my relevant disclosures. So lasers, what is a laser? What does laser stand for? So laser is actually an acronym, which stands for light, because we use light to treat the skin, which is amplified, and then that gets admitted to our skin or to other things that you know, other physicians might treat in the form of radiation. Essentially, laser is a big box which has three different components to it. One of the components is the electricity that powers the laser. And so the electricity comes through the socket on the wall. And uh, what it does is that it excites a lamp that's inside the laser machine, inside the box. And it excites a gain medium. And so the gain medium names the laser. So for example, different types of gain mediums would be gas. So a gas type of laser would be a CO2 laser, a carbon dioxide gas. We also have liquid type gain mediums, which are the forms of dyes, such as pulse dye. And we also have solid uh, gain mediums, which for example, would be a ruby crystal. So inside a ruby laser would be a ruby crystal, and uh, that would be a ruby laser. So what happens is when the lamp excites the gain medium, the gain medium releases a little photon of energy. And this little photon of energy is contained in the laser cavity. And there's many photons that are generated. And these photons, they hit one another. And when they hit one another, they get very, very excited. And they amplify the energy. Uh, because it's bounced between two mirrors in the laser box. And one of the mirrors is not 100% reflective, so a little bit of this energy amplified light comes out of the machine, and that's what we use to do our treatments. So lasers were first uh, used in the 1960s, almost 70 years ago, I guess. 60, 70 years ago. And uh, initially, these first lasers would only cut, ablate, and uh, cook. And so we certainly do not want to cook our patients. Um, and it wasn't really until the 1980s that we understood more about tissue and light interactions and energy. And from the 80s, there developed selective photothermal lysis. The concept of selective photothermal lysis was uh, developed, which then means that we could take laser energy and specifically target things in the skin to affect changes that we want, therapeutic changes. So for example, there are three things that light can do to tissue. Light can be absorbed by tissue, which is what we want, actually. So if we're targeting a blood vessel, for example, if someone has a broken blood vessel on their skin and we want to target it, the light then gets absorbed by that blood vessel and causes the blood vessel to close. So in the skin, we have three natural light-absorbing molecules, which would be water, hemoglobin, and melanin. 
pigment. And so by using different types of light energy, we can target these specific molecules in the skin to affect the changes that we want. So for example, if we're treating a brown spot or uh, irregular pigmentation, we would target melanin. If we have a broken blood vessel and we want to close up that blood vessel, or if someone has a port wine stain, which is a red birthmark, typically on the face, but it can be anywhere else on the body, we would target hemoglobin. And if we're wanting to treat wrinkles or we want to treat acne scars, then we want to kind of vaporize some of the scars away, we would target water. So we want the light to be absorbed. Other things that light does is that light can be scattered, which, or light can go through the material, or light can be reflected, but we don't want that because those things are not of benefit uh, to what we're trying to do. So these are common medical lasers that we use. Uh, there's many of them, um, and I won't go through them all. So as I mentioned earlier, there's different chromophores in the skin that absorb light. There's the hemoglobin, which is what we use to treat broken blood vessels or other vascular type lesions. There's melanin, which is what we use to treat, uh, what we use to target to treat pigmented lesion. And there's water. And different lasers target these different particles, these different um, structures in the skin. So for when we pick what laser we're going to use, so if a patient comes to me and they have a sunspot that they don't like or a birthmark that they don't like, I think, okay, what is the target that I'm, that I'm trying to get? So if it's pigment, then we would choose a pigment laser. So those would be a ruby laser, an alexandrite laser, for example. We want to pick a laser spot size that will cover the area that we want. So a big spot, we would want a bigger laser beam. And we want to get an energy that does something that affects a change to the skin. So should you have laser? How do we decide if a person is a good laser candidate or not? So that depends on your skin type. So the best type of person to have laser is actually someone with fair skin because there's less melanin in the skin um, to, to absorb the laser light. And so the whiter the skin, the better you are at having laser. Darker skin can also have laser, but because the skin is naturally pigmented, you want to look for lasers that have a longer wavelength, so it bypasses the melanin that's naturally found in our skin to make it safer. You should not have laser when you have a tan, because when you're tan, there's more pigment in your skin, and because lasers like to heat up the pigment, it increases the possibility of a burn. So if you go to any good laser physician, they will tell you to avoid doing lasers in the summer months, especially if you're tan. So white, white skin, as white as you can be. What else should you know about uh, if you're going to have laser done? Do you have a skin condition that is prone to what we call kebnerize? So kebnerization is a condition where if you have trauma to the skin, your skin condition will pop up. So a classic example is vitiligo. So vitiligo is a condition where you have white skin, and sometimes if you traumatize it, you can get areas of vitiligo popping up. Psoriasis is another condition where if you traumatize the skin, you can get new lesions of psoriasis. So do be careful if you have these conditions that can spread from trauma or injury, because laser does have a minor injuring component to the skin, so it can cause your skin conditions to pop up, these conditions that kebnerize. Are you prone to scarring? Do you have thick scars? Do you have keloid scars? Because if you do, you might want to be careful with regards to having laser, because it might induce scarring if the laser is not done properly. Do you have an infection at the site that you want to have your treatment? So a lot of people, they have cold sores. So cold sores is a virus that is in the skin, and sometimes when we're stressed or when we get a cold, the cold sore virus can return to the surface. 
So if you typically have cold sores on your upper lip and you're going to do laser hair removal on your upper lip, there's always a chance that the cold sore virus can reactivate. So make sure you tell the person who's doing your laser that you're prone to cold sores so they're aware. And if you do do laser in the area, make sure they put you on medications that will prevent the cold sore from popping up. Are you on medications that make you sensitive to light? Because remember, laser is a form of light therapy. So if you're taking medications that make you photosensitive, again, make sure your provider is aware so that you don't accidentally get burned from the laser because you're on medications that make you sensitive to light. Are you on a medication called Accutane, or it's known as isotretinoin? Uh, isotretinoin or Accutane, it's a medication that makes you more sensitive. And so when you injure yourself, your skin does not heal as fast or as well as it normally would if you were not on Accutane or Isotretinoin. So again, if you're on specific medications like that, make sure you tell your laser provider so that they may either turn down the energy of the laser or defer the laser treatment until you're off the medication. And lastly, gold. So gold is a medication that was used uh, many, many decades ago uh, by rheumatologists often for treatment of inflammation of arthritis, for example. And so when you take gold by mouth, when you laser patients that have taken gold in the past, it may cause some skin discoloration. So when you see um, you know, a physician or a laser provider, always give them your full medical history, what medications you're currently taking, um, just because you want to have the best outcome possible and be safe. So I'm just gonna show some examples of laser treatments. So this is a port wine stain. It's a birthmark, it's many, dilated blood vessels. Typically it occurs on the face, but it can be other areas of the body. And so the chromophore, if for those that were paying attention, what would be the chromophore that we would target? You have a choice of water, hemoglobin, and melanin. Hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is inside the blood vessels. And so by targeting the hemoglobin, we heat up the blood vessels and cause the blood vessels to close. So that's a before and after of a port wine stain. So here, she, there's a woman that has very superficial redness of her cheeks versus under the eye on the other picture, there's a deep blood vessel. So the next thing we consider is where in the skin is the problem? Is it superficial or deep? So as you can see, the blood vessel that's below her eye is a much deeper condition than the redness on the, uh, on the cheeks. So for that, we would want to use a laser that goes deeper into the skin to uh, target what we want. So for treatment of vascular lesions, so anything that's red, essentially, we target hemoglobin. Uh, port wine stains, we typically use a laser called the pulse dye laser. It's considered the gold standard uh, for treatment of port wine stains. And then how rapidly they clear depends on where they are on the body. So typically face treatments, face port wine stains clear faster than ones that are down uh, on the legs, for example. And it's just because with gravity, the blood pools more in the lower body, so it makes these ones more resistant, more uh, stubborn to treat. We have little hemangiomas. So uh, I always say to my patients, after the age of 30, you start getting these little red dots on your skin. I call them signs of wisdom and maturity. But little hemangiomas, uh, they can be treated with laser. Rosacea is a very common condition that we treat with laser. So rosacea is a condition where people flush very easily uh, with common triggers such as you know alcohol, spicy foods, hot coffee, hot tea, stress, being in a very hot room, for example. And rosacea is a treatment that we can commonly treat with laser, as well as broken blood vessels uh, we can treat with laser. Pigmented lesions. So this picture here is a before and after of little sunspots, what we call solar lentigenes. People also refer to them as age spots, but it has nothing to do with age and everything to do with the sun. And so this can be treated with laser. So in this case, what is the chromophore? What is the target in the skin that we're aiming for? Melanin, yeah. 
This is a birthmark. This is called a nevus of ota. And so it's melanin that's deeper in the skin. And again, it can be treated with laser. And so we do use lasers to treat a lot of brown spots. Commonly, these little freckles or sunspots we can treat with laser. But do not treat funny looking moles with laser. So never treat a melanoma or any, you know, uh, moles that are concerned for melanoma with laser because laser does not get rid of the lesion. It only lightens the color so the abnormal cells are still in the skin. And so for anything that's suspicious for a skin cancer, do not have it lasered. Please see a dermatologist, have it biopsied and treat it appropriately. So these are some more examples of things that we can treat with laser. The um, young woman, she has a birthmark on the face called a cafe au lait macule, which uh, we call it that because it's the color of coffee. That can be treated with laser sometimes. And uh, in the middle picture there, there's a gentleman with a hairy patch on his back. The hair can be treated with laser. And sometimes the background brown patch too uh, might respond. With the nevus spilus, which is the picture on the far right, so it's a brown patch with all these little brown speckles in it, that we call a nevus spilus. It's very controversial to treat it with laser or not. Most would recommend not because this type of lesion, there's a small risk of it turning into melanoma. And as I said earlier, we never should treat melanomas with laser. So it's better to monitor these for changes and to biopsy as necessary, as opposed to just treating it with laser for cosmetic reasons. These are some other pigment, uh, pigmented lesions. So we have nevus of ota again, and we have melasma. So melasma is a condition where uh, typically affects females. They get dark uh, from sun exposure. It can be associated with being pregnant, being on the birth control pill, and it's very stubborn to treat. Typically, we recommend sun protection using a high number SPF, like an SPF 50 or 60, every single day. If they're on hormonal treatments and they don't need to be going off of the hormonal treatments if possible, and you can try laser, but unfortunately, you know, even if you do laser and it gets better, if you go out in the sun and you don't have sunscreen on or you're not photoprotected, the melasma tends to come back. And then there's some interesting pigmentations uh, that are caused by taking medication. So a common example would be uh, minocycline. Minocycline is an antibiotic that sometimes we use in the treatment of acne. And if people take minocycline for long, long periods of time, it can cause some discoloration of the skin. So laser may be effective at treating some of these drug-induced pigmentation changes. Laser hair removal. So laser hair removal is like one of the most popular laser treatments uh, available. And people, especially women, they don't want facial hair. It's unattractive. It causes them lowered self-esteem or self-consciousness. And so we can do laser hair removal for unwanted facial hair and it has good results. So typically, it's a series of treatments. I tell patients it's about six to eight treatments on average. There's about a 10 to 20% reduction with the hair with each treatment. It'll never even be zero hair, but it's much better um, you know, after the series of treatments than before. And so here we're targeting the hair follicle. And because the laser is targeting the pigment in the hair follicle, destroy the hair, it only works on dark hair. So people that have white hair, they're not good candidates for laser hair removal because there's not enough pigment in the white hair for it to work. So skin rejuvenation. So we use lasers to rejuvenate the skin. So this is someone with lots of wrinkles around the mouth area here. And so here we're targeting water because cells, 80% of cells are water. So if we could target the water and vaporize the water, we end up vaporizing the cells. So we're vaporizing layers of skin to smooth out the wrinkles. So this is a picture here, a before and after. So really quite dramatic results following laser resurfacing. So this again is to resurface or smooth out all the wrinkles. 
Laser resurfacing, though, is not for, yes, it's not for people that have a squeamish stomach, because since you're vaporing off layers of skin, there's raw skin, uh, and there's healing that's involved. So usually people yeah, hide at home for two to three weeks uh, with wound care, dressings. But at the end, after about six weeks, their skin is brand new and uh, the sun damage and the wrinkles are gone. Not for everyone, right? Um, so because, you know, laser resurfacing is very scary, sometimes we choose not to vaporize the whole skin at once and we do little columns of resurfacing. So then in between the columns you have normal skin, so it helps with wound healing and faster recovery time. So on the left there's a picture of a person that had full skin resurfacing, so red skin inflamed versus a lesser treatment, what we call a fractionated treatment, where they're just a little bit sunburned. Okay, when bad treatments happen. So with lasers, because it is a medical procedure, there's always uh, redness and a little bit of swelling that can last for a couple of days, but it's abnormal for redness to last longer. So if it lasts for weeks to months, there's something wrong and you should go see your laser provider just for follow-up. Sometimes the skin can become pigmented after, so the skin can be either lighter or darker post-laser. And that often occurs when people have had too much sun exposure following laser. So I always tell patients, after the laser treatment is done, please use high number sunscreens and a hat and protect the area from sunlight. Otherwise, there's a good chance the skin can darken. And that's another reason why we don't do laser treatments as often in the summer months compared to the winter. Sometimes people can get swelling post-laser. Sometimes people can get little acne breakouts post-laser. And then after laser, the skin is sensitive. So be careful what you put on your skin. Try not to use too many perfumed or scented products because it can irritate the skin and cause eczema or dermatitis. Infection can happen post-laser. So one of the common infections is the cold sore outbreak, the herpes simplex that I mentioned earlier. So if you're treating around the mouth area, you know, if you have had cold sores in the past, please mention it to your laser provider so they may be able to give you medications to pre prevent cold sore infections. And then scarring is a potential that can happen with laser. So some cases. So this is a 57-year-old woman. She went to a medical spa because she wanted some freckles removed on her chest. So she did it in the middle of summer when her skin was tan. So we already know that that's a big no-no, right, for laser. So after the treatment, she developed crusting and blistering from laser. Yeah. So what went wrong? The operator did not know what they were doing. Yes or no? The patient was too tan to be safely treated, the settings were too high, or all of the above? All of, the above. All of yes, good job. All of the above. Case two. So this is a 32-year-old male. He's dark-skinned. He went for laser hair removal on his chest. And the person doing the laser treatment just used the one laser that they had, which they used for all skin types, white skin uh, to dark skin. And a week later, he developed pigmentation changes on his skin. So what went wrong here? Was it because you should never do laser hair removal on the chest, or the patient was too tan, or the wrong laser was used, or the pulses weren't laid down properly, and so he had all these spots on his chest. What was the problem? The wrong, the wrong laser was used. Yes, and also, yes. And he was tan. He's dark skin, so they should have used a different type of laser, not the laser that they would use in someone that's white skin. Last case. So this is a 29-year-old woman. She had laser hair removal to the upper lip. And shortly after treatment, they gave her just a plain old ointment called Aquaphor to put on. But several days after that, she developed these little painful blisters on her upper lip. What was the problem here? Did she have an allergic reaction to the ointment? Did she get a reactivation of the cold sore virus, herpes simplex virus? Did she get candida infection? Or were the laser settings too high? Two, yes, yeah, so she got a cold sore outbreak. 
Yeah, so this is a cold sore outbreak post laser. So again, if you do have a history of cold sores, you know, tell your laser provider um, that you're prone to it and that they can give you medications to prevent that from happening. So in conclusion, when you're going to have laser treatments done, make sure you go to someone that knows what they're doing because it's better to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble. That's it. Kusi, yeah. thank you so much. Um, you both made, uh, you, you did the wonderful uh, gamut of showing how great laser is, and then at the same time scaring the pants off of people. <laughs> uh, and they haven't even seen your bill yet, so. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, like with many things, you know, you shouldn't, uh, don't do it if you can't take a joke. Uh, you have to be careful. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, again, if we have questions, uh, especially people who came in, the volunteer, volunteers or volunteer, is walking around, just one, but she's walking around here, there's a question card over here. You can just hold up, you're not bidding to buy anything, there's no risk. You just hold up the card. Um, I'd like to say there's no such thing as stupid questions, but I'm sure we can prove that wrong. So be brave, write down a stupid question, and uh, we'll have fun with it. There's more over there, it's actually easier for me to see than the volunteer. Oh, no, she's great. She's picking up stuff all over the place. Okay. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Lori Shapiro, who uh, is uh, my colleague in the drug safety clinic and in the dermatology clinic uh, and, um, and, and runs her own clinics in uh, Thornhill. She's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in both uh, dermatology and in uh, pharmacology. And uh, she has a weekly uh, general dermatology, medical dermatology clinic at Sunnybrook. Uh, and as I mentioned, she has the Thornhill, Thornhill Dermatology Center uh, which is, uh, I guess, could be known as the Laurie Shapiro Dermatology Center, but there's a bunch of good people there, so that's great. Uh, Laurie's going to talk about adverse, it just sounds like more scary stuff, but adverse drug reactions in the skin, and uh, Brittany can make everything sound nice later, it'll be great. Um, so welcome, Laurie, and uh, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. So I just need to know how to navigate to my talk here. You can use the pointer. Yeah, it'll come up. If you go forward, it should come up. Oh, you have to. Does it have to go back to the? Uh, yeah, home screen. Okay. We get to vote which speaker we want to hear. Here you go. Still okay. Here you go. Perfect. Okay. So I don't have any conflicts of interest. Thanks for your kind introduction, and thanks for having me here tonight. And for those of you who don't know, Thornhill is the city above Toronto. Okay, so tonight's talk is gonna be about cutaneous adverse drug reactions in the skin. And I'm gonna try and go through it and illustrate why we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk a little about what are we talking about, introduce you to a little bit of the nomenclature of drug reactions. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the how of drug reactions, how we help diagnose patients with skin testing, with patch testing, with some pharmacogenetic testing, and what the ultimate advice is to patients. And ideally we like to free patients for, for use, future use of medications, to allow them to use as many as they can as in, and break down barriers or restrictions. So the why. So uh, I always tell my patients that I chose well, that the skin is the largest organ of the body. Why restrict yourself to the heart or to the eyes? And uh, similarly, in terms of adverse drug reactions, the skin is the most common uh, target organ of adverse reactions. So as dermatologists, as Dr. Shear mentioned, we're uniquely positioned to diagnose these. And sometimes we get patients sent to clinics saying, the patient is on penicillin, they have this rash, tell me that they're allergic to penicillin. And the rash is a primary skin disease, has nothing to do with the penicillin. But really the sort of keen eye of a dermatologist is able to discern this. About 2 to 3 percent of, of hospitalized patients will have adverse drug reactions. Uh, reaction rates can range and they're highest for antibiotics and they can range from just sort of minor sort of slightly itchy skin, skin eruptions to life-threatening skin disease where people end up in a burn unit and are there for weeks of, thera for weeks of treatment and subsequent therapy with a lot of uh, long-term consequences after. So that's why I think they're important. There are many types of skin drug eruptions. So when we see patients, and this is a young lady who's presented with a fairly generalized rash, we have the advantage as dermatologists that we can use the skin as a clue as to what might be going on. But I'm here just to remind that that, that visual part may just be the tip of the iceberg, and we have to take a proper 
history and physical exam because what's going on in the skin may be in fact be representative of what may be happening underneath. They may have underlying uh, associated rather kidney disease or liver disease or cardiac disease or, or uh, cerebral disease and that requires a uh, good history and physical when you assess these patients. So we sort of have an approach when we are assessing these patients in the clinic, both when I see them in dermatology when they're acute, and then when I see them later on when they come and tell me the story about what might have happened after drug exposure. So the first and foremost is the diagnosis. So the skin can only react in so many patterns, and for every pattern there's a differential diagnosis. So you, again, rash and penicillin doesn't necessarily mean penicillin caused it. You have to be systematic in the way you approach these things. In terms of drug exposure, it's really important to get a really good detailed history of drug exposure. And since I'm speaking to you, I'm sort of imploring that when you see a physician, it's really important that you bring all your medications with you. Don't assume that the referring physician has put it on the referral, because most of the times they do not. And besides prescription medications, it's also important that we get a detailed drug history about herbal medications and over-the-counter medications, things that are taken regularly, but things also that could be taken intermittently. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about diagnostic testing that can help us rule in or rule out drug allergy. Uh, sometimes when it's, there's a few medications involved, we also go to the literature to see what's been reported and see out of the four or five medications somebody's been on, is there a higher likelihood of one being involved rather than another? And finally, as I mentioned, as a dermatologist, we're uniquely positioned to see these patients, often in the acute setting, and I sort of get the follow-up when I see these patients months later in drug safety clinic and try and help evaluate and navigate and try and free them for, for drug use in the future. So what are we talking about? So basically, the first approach is when we look at the patient with the rash, we try and ferret out what kind of rash is this. So this is the, probably the most common type of drug reaction that we see. We call it morbilliform or measles-like or an exanthem, where somebody's got a fairly diffuse sort of red bumpy rash. Some of the time it is extremely itchy. Sometimes it's not really bothersome to the patient, but, it, but people who have to look at the patient are bothered because it looks terrible. This is more something that we describe as hives or urticaria, and you can see that the lesions can range in size from a few millimeters to a centimeter, and sometimes they join up and form large patches. One of the helpful clues with uh, hives is that if you ask a patient if they circle the lesion, how long do they think it would last? And generally, it's about 24 to 48 hours, and that can be helpful in making the diagnosis. Again, there's a differential diagnosis, but this is really commonly what we would perceive as hives. So this is somebody who presents as sicker. They've got a, uh, the Band-Aid sign, which is the sign that somebody's been at them with a little skin punch biopsy to help make a diagnosis. But I hope you can appreciate that there's sort of more generalized redness to the skin, and it is studied with little pustules. So this is a pustular drug reaction. And some are more bland appearing and can look like acne. We call them acneiform. In this case, this is a specific drug reaction pattern called AGEP, A-G-E-P, which stands for acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. And people present, they're feverish, they're quite unwell, and they have a rash that looks like this, which is pretty nasty. And finally, sort of at the very edge of the spectrum are scars or severe cutaneous adverse reactions are patients who can present with their skin literally sort of shedding off. You can see that there's areas uh, of inflammation and uh, blistering, and then there's almost like a skin tear on the, bucket, on the, on the uh, buttock rather, that you can easily just sort of pull that uh, layer of skin off. These patients are extremely sick. They often have, we'll talk about involvement of their mucous membranes, their oral cavity, their genitals, their eyes, and these are the kind of patients that often are managed here in our Sunnybrook burn unit because they have trouble uh, regulating their temperature with the extent of involvement. They use lots of fluid and they require intense nursing care to manage their wounds. So that's something that you want to pick up on fairly early. So as I mentioned, we went through the different types of uh, morphologies, the measles-like or exanthem-like, uh, urticarial or hive-like, pustulars, and blistering. So the other things that we want to add, uh, evaluate when we see these patients is how sick are they? Are they just a sort of a bland rash that's not causing much problem, or are they feeling pretty lousy? So one of the, one of the worrisome signs is when you have a rash in association with fever. And then you may also ask about, you know, appetite, anorexia, malaise, fatigue, chills. Those are all more worrisome uh, kinds of symptoms because then they portend a reaction that may not just be involving the skin, like when I showed the lady and said it was the tip of the iceberg, but a reaction pattern that's involving other organs as well. So a drug hypersensitivity syndrome is something that we define by fever, 
and rash and internal organ involvement, be that kidneys or liver or pancreas, etc. There's also a reaction pattern called a serum sickness-like reaction, where people can get fever, a hive-like rash like I showed you, and joint pain. And again, these patients are sicker and require treatment other than stopping the medication usually. So again, just another set of pictures to show you the measles-like one, the hives. There's another picture of a woman with a blistering rash. She's quite sick and you can see the sheet-like desquamation of her face and then the pustular drug eruption. So again, clues when we take our history, often these drug reactions start off, the more severe ones, they'll have a lot of facial edema. So that can be a clinical clue because these reaction patterns can evolve quite quickly. So obviously trying to identify them as early as possible, stopping the culprit drug makes a difference to the outcome. So erythroderma is somebody who's got more than 90% of their body that is red. So again, worrisome findings. And the other non-skin findings that I mentioned that were worrisome are the constitutional symptoms, like the fever, malaise, fatigue, having enlarged lymph nodes, and again, potential for internal organ involvement. So I thought I'd try to illustrate some of what we do with a variety of cases. So this is a picture of a 15-year-old boy who received penicillin for a strep throat and developed this kind of rash. So if you had to sort of broadly say, and it's quite, he's quite itchy, if you had to sort of give it a name, would you say that it's measles-like, hive-like, blistering, pustular? What does that look like to you? Yes, Dr. Shear, hive-like reaction. And what's often typical of drug-induced hives is you can see the linear pattern here where the boy has scratched. This is what we call pressure hives or dermographism, and that's quite typical of drug-induced hives. And even when the large picture goes away, that ability to cause the hives when they scratch themselves can persist for several months after that. So this is uh, often it, patients develop type 1 or IgE-mediated antibodies to the penicillin that links to one of our proteins in our body, and we can do testing for that. I often hear that, oh, well, I must be allergic to penicillin, my mom's allergic, my sister's allergic, my brother's allergic, but really in the setting we find that family history is not really important. So how can we help evaluate him? He might have come, he, this might have happened, he was 15, now he presents in the drug safety clinic, he's 35 and he wants to know, am I still allergic to penicillin? Which is a reasonable question because some of us can lose allergy over time, but it can't tell by looking at you whether you're still allergic or not. So what we offer to patients like him is skin prick testing or intradermal testing to penicillin and its various um, proteins in the skin to look to see whether they locally develop a hive-like reaction. So what we actually do with these patients is we inject a little bit of saline, which is our negative control. We actually inject a little bit of histamine, which will cause a hive to develop. And then we inject the drug. So the saline, there should be no reaction. At the histamine site, there is a hive-like reaction. And then we compare with the patient's response to the, when the actual drug is administered. So if that's the response, which is a hive-like reaction, we say, you know what, you really still are allergic to penicillin. You need to avoid penicillin and its cousins. Conversely, if we were testing him in the clinic and there's actually no response, so the response is comparable to the saline injection, then although the skin testing is useful, the ultimate challenge is going to be an oral challenge because this is what patients are going to do in real life. He wants to know if he gets penicillin in the future, is he going to be okay? So then what we do is we give them a tablet of penicillin in the clinic. We keep them in the clinic for about four to six hours because that's the likeliest time frame that if they're going to have a reaction, they would have one. We have a dedicated doctor and a nurse in the clinic, so evaluating them periodically periodically looking at the skin, checking the vital signs, listening to the breathing. And I will tell you that about 98% of the time, if the, or if the skin testing is negative, we will not have a problem with the oral challenge and we can free him for future penicillin use. And that's what this clinic is about, to give patients more options. So this is a second case. This is a 47-year-old woman who came to see us, and she was undergoing in vitro fertilization. She had no children, and she was desperate to have a child. So at the, at the fertility clinic that she was at, she was receiving two preparations. She was getting an estrogen orally, and then at a certain point in the cycle, then she would be getting intramuscular progesterone injections. So she told me that she did this regimen in the first cycle. Unfortunately, she didn't get pregnant, and, but she had no problem. So then she embarks on cycle number two. She takes her oral uh, estrogen component, and then about 14 days into receiving the intramuscular progesterone shots, she starts to get sort of diff these painful red uh, spots on her arms, which ultimately blistered. Then they healed, she's dark skinned, so they, she had some pigmentation, so unfortunately still not successfully pregnant, and she's desperate to have a baby. So she goes into the third cycle of her in vitro fertilization, and this time only eight days into the 
uh, progesterone component, she develops exactly blistering lesions in the same location on her arms. But they were quite painful, and she was actually quite worried. She went to the emergency room. They put her on antibiotics where they might be infected. So she comes to the clinic because she's desperate to continue with her treatment, but now she's seeing that it, there's an escalating pattern here with her exposures. So she comes to us to say, is there an, another option for me? So basically, this is, uh, this is not her, but this is somebody who developed these red patches, and there's a suggestion here that it's blistering. And it's very unusual to get a, here of a history where in the same spot, something keeps coming back. Dr. Pong already told you about one condition, which is the cold sore virus or herpes simplex, which can be recurrent in the same location. But in the arena of drug reactions, a fixed drug eruption is one of those indications. And the unique thing about fixed drug reactions is that we have the ability to test them with something that we call patch testing. So this is used in dermatology to test um, different kind of reactions, but in the arena of drug reactions, it's quite useful with uh, fixed drug eruption. These are called fin chambers, the little metal discs. Generally, we have the drug that's dissolved in uh, Vaseline or petrolatum because it's a good occluder and it doesn't degrade the drug. And this is put either on the patient's back or in the setting of fixed drug eruption, the yield is actually higher when you place the patches at the site of where the patient reacted. So. Basically, uh, one thing I need to, st to state at the outset, I guess, is that not all drugs are amenable to patch testing. Some drugs are just too irritating. You put a concentration, you occlude it on a patient's skin, they're going to get a reaction, but it's more of an irritant reaction. It's not really that they're allergic. So we try and get pure drug if we can, and we look at the literature to see what's been reported, and we use concentrations in the range generally of 1 to 10%. And if it's positive, it's very helpful in confirming what you suspect may be the culprit drug. If it's negative, not so useful, doesn't rule it out. It's, the utility here is really in the setting of when it's positive. The other useful thing about patch tests is that the risk of reactivating and causing the reaction to flare is very low, so it's pretty safe. And in certain drug classes where there are three or four different drugs within a drug class, the patch test is helpful because you may get specificity to one particular drug in the family, but the others are negative, so it frees that person for three other possibilities in the family, even if they have to avoid that one drug specifically. So generally, this is what the, the patches are put in, when in, in some settings on the back. And I've had the lower picture just illustrates to you what a positive reaction can look like. The, the lower, this person had uh, 10 discs put here. You can see where the, there's those red blotches, the red, the swellings. Those are sites of positive reactions. And where you see nothing, there is no reaction. So what we did with this woman is that we tested the left forearm where she had some of her lesions. We tested her to estrogen, the preparation. We tested her to the whole progesterone injection that she got as a patch test. We separated out the pure progesterone. We separated out two preservatives that were in there, which is benzoyl alcohol, and the other one was an, a specific oil that they emulsified the whole injection in. And what you can see is that to the whole progesterone um, ampule that she was uh, injecting, she had a significant plus four, which is the most significant reaction you can have with swelling and a bit of blistering. And when we looked at the actual components, what she was reacting was one of the preservatives, was the benzoyl alcohol in the preparation. So the next thing what we did is that we gave the results to her fertility clinic, who together with a compounding pharmacy was able to give her single dose ampules without any preservative so that she could su successfully retreat herself. She did not get any recurrent blistering lesions on her arms, and she actually came to clinic two weeks ago to show me her healthy baby girl. So this was like a real, uh, a real success story for her. And this is sort of the real, the end of the spectrum. These are one of the severe cutaneous adverse reactions that we can see. This is a 42-year-old Indian woman who presents to Sunnybrook Emergency Room. As you can see, she's got extensive crusting around her mouth. You can appreciate that she's got some uh, rash on her face. And she's got extensive blistering. And this is somebody who ended up in our Sunnybrook burn unit. So this is a condition called toxic epidermal necrolysis, and it's usually defined by at least more than 30% of the body surface area that starts detaching itself. This is a critical situation. That's why she's in the burn unit requiring one-on-one -on -one nursing. It often has mucosal involvement or involvement of the oral cavity. The eyes are at risk, the genitals and the rectum are at risk. And over 90% of the time, the culprit of this kind of reaction is drug. So that's how it I've highlighted here. So then besides sort of managing her supportively, the other part of this is what the, what the heck caused this in her. So the referring physician who asked uh, dermatology to see her favors amoxicillin, which was started the day before for a sore throat. 
but the dermatology resident wisely obtains a complete drug history and found out that she started an anti-epileptic medication called carbamazepine only two weeks before. So, so trying to figure out what might have caused it. So really, the, uh, she has an, an at-risk group, because what I'm going to tell you is that what's new, since I even got into this game in the 90s, is pharmacogenetic testing. She, she is a group that is at risk. Her ethnicity in this, in this situation matters. When we're looking at timing, sort of amoxyl started 24 hours before, or the anti-epileptic drug started two weeks before, the two weeks timing is much actually more favorable for ascribing a cause. Truthfully, she actually, when she presented with her sore throat, she was already probably getting erosions in her mouth, and that's what was causing the, the sore throat, and that's why she got the amoxyl. But her reaction was underway. And if you have a look in the literature to see, well, if we look at how many times amoxicillin can cause this reaction versus how many times carbamazepine can cause this reaction, you'll find it that astoundingly there's a lot higher proportion ascribed to the anti-epileptic. So it's really important to get the history. Sometimes in our minds we have a bias to drugs, but it's really important to actually go through a detailed drug history. Dr. Shear showed me how to do a proper timeline in evaluating this, and it really is critical. It goes back again, when you see your doctor, bring all your medicines, prescription and over-the-counter. So the question is, I am alluded to pharmacogenetics, so what test can you do to help? So she was never screened, but there's now a pharmacogenetic test that you can look at that would tell us that she was a person that would have been more susceptible to develop this kind of severe reaction. So uh, this test can be ordered. The populations at risk are those with a variety of uh, ancestries from Asian countries, China, Thailand, Malaysia, or India, and about 72 anywhere from 70 to 100 percent of patients with carbamazepine-induced kind of reactions carry this marker. So when in countries now where this is sort of standard of care, the incidence of these severe reactions in that population has, has uh, significantly been reduced. So then the question is, should genetic testing be performed a priori in all patients? And Dr. Shear helped author the article, and the answer is a resounding yes. It's a simple blood test that, what, that the prescribing physician can order. Obviously, the severity of this kind of reaction would warrant a test like that. If, you, if she knew that this could have been prevented, don't you think she would have wanted it to be prevented? I mean, who wouldn't, right? Um, the use of carbamazepine, which is trade name is Tegretol, is a very common drug. And again, it, it, because it can affect patients of, uh, mixed an, of, of certain ethnicities and with in, interracial, in, inter rate marriage, etc. there's a lot of mixed ancestry. So you may not know for sure whether these patients carry the genetic um, risk factor, so you just, you just screen them. The other thing is, is that carbamazepine in her situation wasn't the only drug that could have been chosen, so an alternative was available for her. So when it does matter, early discontinuation of the culprit drug certainly reduces the mortality of this disease, and when we prescribe drugs that are known to potentially cause this, people have to be aware, that you be on the alert for, I tell patients, fever, rash, you stop the medicine, you, you seek medical attention. So she was admitted to the burn unit. She was treated with an anti-immunosuppressant, uh, rather, called cyclosporin. And fortunately for her, she did recover. But she was still in a burn unit and went through this for three to four weeks. And in the end, although her skin has healed, she, is, she, is, um, she has uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. She's not a uniform color anymore. She's quite speckled where she had a lot of the blistering. So where, where our role is with these patients, often as we counsel, she can never have this medication again. So she has to have a medical alert and her records have to be labeled appropriately. There are certain cross-reacting drugs that we know with carbamazepine. So we give her clearly on that medical alert bracelet, we advise for the other drugs she should avoid. Well, we think that these kind of reactions are quite rare, like about one in 10,000. We know because of genetics that first degree relatives are at higher risk. So she has to be told that her siblings, her first degree relatives should not get this medication either. And then, of course, it comes back to, well, this antibiotic that she got the day before. Could she take that again in the future? And the answer would be yes. So again, our role in the clinic is giving advice to the patient, family counseling, and also these cases that tend to get reported. When new drugs come onto market, there's often not a critical exposure in pre-marketing to detect rare events like this. So it's often case reports that become the first signal that these drugs may be that there may be a, a signal from a drug that can cause such severe reactions. So physician reporting is really important. So I want to conclude by just going over the reason I thought we should talk about this is because drug reactions are common. They can range from fairly banal to life-threatening. 
What are they? We, I thought I'd try to introduce to you some of the drug reaction patterns, how they're determined by how they look, and then we separate out fever or not. And finally, how we can help patients, whether it's with skin testing, patch testing, or pharmacogenetic screening. One day I hope we're at the stage where we can actually do a blood test and sort of come up with a designer uh, pattern and tell patients these are the drugs you'd be safe to take, these are the ones you stay away from. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lori. Um, okay, if that, if that didn't scare you, just, just to tell you also, um, the Stevens-Johnson, the SJS, the last bad disease that she was talking about, foundation, uh, founder and uh, president of the, uh, of the foundation is actually here at the uh, table there. She has the copies of these, she has those, but for herself and the group. But for those of you who've seen the Sunnybrook, the fabulous Sunnybrook magazine, uh, there's a great article in here by Judy Gerstel that describing uh, about that condition. And, but I like her subheading, well, it's called Network for Healing. A unique collaboration of experts gives patients with a rare skin disorder a fighting chance. And um, as Dr. Shapiro said, the uh, testing uh, is something we've been spending a lot of time on, well, 20 years, but uh, more recently it's been heating up and it's available in many countries where this is of a high frequency, uh, but uh, clearly I think uh, it's a right in any uh, country to have that covered to make sure that if you can get the safest medication, you should be able to. Uh, but that's another bigger story. Uh, so thanks very much, Lori. It's really, um, it's really important stuff. So now I'm going to uh, introduce... Uh, Brittany, so yeah, you're going to set it up, uh, Kevin, and then I'll, I'll just chit chat while you're doing that. Um, again, if you have questions, our volunteer is uh, standing by, and uh, you can ask questions. We've got a lot of questions. We won't be able to answer all of them, I don't think, uh, actually because we don't know the answers, that's why. But, uh, but for the ones we do know, hopefully we can uh, dig into those. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, so, Brittany Waller is a board-certified dermatologist in Canada and the U.S., and she's currently practicing in the community and is currently the uh, Dermatologic Laser Surgery and Aesthetic uh, Fellow uh, with uh, Dr. Pond and Dr. Bertucci in the community, who also works with us there. And she'll be speaking about common skin conditions and everyday dermatology. So, welcome, Dr. Waller. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shear. And thank you to all of you guys for coming to spend your Thursday night with us. Uh, six years ago, actually, when I was a medical student, before I became a dermatologist, I came to this exact talk um, when I was working at Sunnybrook. So it's kind of nice to be sort of full circle and now um, sort of giving some tips and things to all of you. So um, to start, these are my disclosures of a few things that I've done in the past. And I thought before we talk a little bit about common dermatology conditions, we should probably talk a little bit about what a dermatologist does, how to become a dermatologist, just so you have some ideas of what things the, these types of specialists may manage for you. Um, so dermatologists are medical doctors who've completed uh, medical school as well as residency, and they are the ones that are responsible for managing, diagnosing, and treating conditions affecting the skin the nails, hair, as well as mucous membranes. So mucous membranes are sort of in the eye. We work with ophthalmologists on that, conditions affecting the mouth and affecting the genital area. I know a lot of people, you know, think of Dr. Pimple Popper or that that's kind of the only thing dermatologists deal with, but there's actually over 3,000 conditions uh, that dermatologists do manage. Um, so this is a busy slide, so I'm just going to summarize of some of the types of things that we see and treat. So we do treat inflammatory conditions, basically where you have a rash or inflammation in the skin, and things like that would include acne, rosacea, uh, eczema, or psoriasis. We also treat skin cancers, which we're going to sort of focus a little bit on in this talk today, uh, because that's a very, very important part of dermatology. 
Uh, dermatologists also deal with drug reactions and blistering conditions, uh, much like you've heard from Dr. Shapiro. And they're also involved in surgical treatment of both benign things, you know, skin tags, mole removals, as well as the um, surgeries related to the skin cancers and the reconstruction. As I mentioned before, they deal with hair disease. So people that have hair loss or symptoms on their scalp, uh, individuals who have nail problems as well, whether it's a nail infection, um, inflammation in the nail, color changes, those all are things that we are trained to treat. Dermatologists also deal with wounds. So if you think about an ulcer on the foot that you may get as a diabetic, uh, an ulcer secondary to trauma, dermatologists are the specialists involved in that, um, as well as just a number of other things under the sun that fall under those 3,000 different diseases. Uh, so these are just a couple of photos of a few things that we may see in dermatology. Uh, so up here, this is somebody who has a hair loss condition. Over here, you can see this patient has a growth uh, that the dermatologist would be able to diagnose and manage. Down here, we have a mole that looks a little bit unusual. That's something a dermatologist would treat. We see an example of some nail problems. Here's some conditions that lead to lightening of the skin. Here we have another one of those inflammatory conditions, and we'll talk about that in detail. Here we have um, something called vasculitis, where it's inflammation of blood vessels that we treat, uh, and some blistering conditions, moles. So these are just some photos to show you just how wide um, the practice of dermatology is. So how does someone become a dermatologist? So after high school, uh, if you want to become a dermatologist, you do have to go to university and complete undergraduate courses. Uh, often some medical schools do require you have a degree first, um, so that is often requires uh, four years of study. Uh, after that, they do need to have a certain average, and most medical schools require that you do write something called the MCAT, or the Medical College Admissions Test, uh, in order to apply. Then once you're accepted into medical school, it's usually a four-year program. There are some institutions in Canada where it is three years. Uh, then once you finish medical school, you're not done yet. Uh, there's a five-year residency of sort of on-the-job training where you become an expert working in clinics with the staff that presented here, uh, learn your surgical skills, and learn all of these conditions that you are to manage. And then if you so wish, there's also additional training after that uh, where you can do extra years in um, you know, laser treatment, much like Dr. Pond, in hair transplant, skin cancer reconstruction. So there's lots of different areas um, in dermatology and and thus there's lots of education required. Um, so, you know, if you do have a question about your skin, it's great to trust a dermatologist or see a dermatologist because they have so much training in this area, particularly if you're thinking of doing a procedure, you know, you do want to uh, go to someone who's well-trained. So that's why I'd recommend to come and see us. We'd be happy to help you out. So um, now we're just gonna talk about a few sort of day-to-day -day skin conditions that we may see, some things that are common. You may even recognize these on yourselves. Uh, as we go through some of the slides. So the first condition we're gonna talk about is something called atopic dermatitis. The other fancy name for the, or that's the fancy name, uh, sorry, for eczema. Uh, there's different types of eczema, but this is one thing that we see very commonly in dermatology. Basically, this is a chronic, common recurrent itchy skin condition. We often call this the itch that rashes. So people with this condition will have very itchy skin that leads to scratching and then they get sort of a rash, a red sort of open crusted area. And it's sort of a vicious cycle that keeps going and going. This is common to start in childhood, although it doesn't always have to. And while some children grow out of their eczema, it is common that this can still continue in adulthood. The one thing that will change is sort of the way your eczema presents on the skin. So babies may have more eczema sort of on the face. In childhood, it goes and favors some areas on the arms and legs. And adults with chronic eczema often involves areas like the hands and the face. Um, the reason why people get eczema is because of a lot of different things. So usually there's a genetic predisposition, so something that runs in families. Um, there's research that's shown some uh, mutations in certain components of the skin that make you prone to the eczema. Uh, so it's not something necessarily that a person has done. It's not a contagious condition. Um, it's something that just sort of happens because of genetic influences. Um, there are some things that make eczema worse, so, you know, dry weather, heat, sweating and things. Um, so while that can contribute to eczema, that's not usually the cause of it itself. 
Uh, we're often asked a lot of questions, you know, is this contagious? Is there a cure? Things like that. As I mentioned, it's not a disease you can pass to someone else. And we don't have a cure for eczema, but we have a lot of treatments than things that we can get it under control so patients can just uh, go ahead and live their everyday, you know, life. So here's just some photos of some people with eczema. So here's a little baby. You see they have this red kind of scaly areas on the cheeks. It's not so well defined, like it's not so easy to draw a line sort of where the eczema stops and ends. You can see this little one is quite itchy, scratching away in the picture. Over here on the leg, we see a little bit more kind of crusting and open areas. That can happen with eczema when it's sort of been scratched um, or traumatized. And over here, we see a little bit of thickening of the skin, which can sometimes happen too. From all that scratching and rubbing, the skin's way to defend is sort of make it a little bit thicker so that the skin gets thicker in uh, areas that have the eczema. So how do we treat eczema? So we always wanna start with behavioral measures or things that you wanna do at home. So we recommend in people with sensitive skin or eczema that when you bathe, you wanna use warm water, not too hot, uh, because one of the reasons you have eczema is your skin is sort of opening, you're losing the moisture out of the skin, and when you get the skin cracked and open, then allergens and irritants can come into that. Um, we do recommend that you patch your skin dry as well, not rub too much, because you can imagine if you have sensitive skin Again, rubbing or friction might make the eczema a little bit worse. Uh, and then we recommend moisturizing. That is sort of one of the biggest keys to a lot of skin conditions is to make sure that you try and repair your water barrier and sort of repair the damaged skin. A really common question we're asked is, what's the best moisturizer? To be honest, the best moisturizer is something you're willing to put on. So some people don't like Vaseline because of the texture. Some people prefer something else. So basically, whatever moisturizer you'll put on your skin is something that we're happy with. But we do suggest you try to avoid um, moisturizers with a lot of fragrance, preservatives, dyes, sort of simple things are better. Uh, and later on, I'll tell you um, a resource where you can go and find some recommended skin products and things. Um, we do recommend to wear cotton clothing because you do want to keep the skin, um, you know, prevent that moisture, prevent overheating. Uh, you want to use gentle laundry products, so nothing that's too heavily scented, as I've mentioned, and avoid sort of fabric softener, which can sort of um, prevent the wicking of the clothing and contribute to some of the heat. Now, treatment for uh, eczema depends on the type you know, of eczema you have or the severity. Uh, we have a lot of topical creams that we usually start with, um, some which are called calcineurin inhibitors, which basically work to decrease inflammation. Uh, and then we also have steroids, which is a very um, common medication that we recommend. A lot of people are worried about steroids. So they're worried about thinning of the skin or they've read online that they can be very dangerous. Uh, but when they're used appropriately, they are excellent treatments and the cornerstone of a lot of things that we treat in dermatology. When you think of steroids, there's not one steroid that fits all. So we have our steroids available over the counter that sort of have a potency way down here. And then there's some that are very strong that are way up here. Uh, and so if you use the appropriate steroid within that for your condition, which your dermatologist will help you with, that helps to prevent any of those side effects. Also, those side effects are more common if you're using steroid, you know, two or three times a day for months and months and months on end on normal skin. So if you're using your steroid on the thick, damaged skin, that's where you want to treat. It usually does a great job of decreasing the inflammation. Some people with eczema though, the creams and gels don't help, so they do need to go for other treatments. So sometimes we do something called phototherapy, which is a type of medical light that helps with eczema. And then some people do need pills and things for their eczema. So we have medication, medications like methotrexate or cyclosporin, which help to decrease the immune response in this condition. Uh, and there's also a new injectable medication that's come out recently that can help with eczema. So even if you have it, you see there's lots of different things that we can do. The next thing we'll touch on is acne. Acne is a very common condition. Again, probably everyone in this room at one point has had a small little spot on their face um, that eventually went away. So although acne is common in teenagers, we can see it presenting in children and also certain adults may still have acne uh, into adulthood. Uh, people who have acne in adult years, it's more common actually in women and sometimes can have a hormonal relationship. Um, and acne can commonly affect the areas of our body that have sebaceous glands, which are sort of the oil producing glands. So common on the face, the shoulders, the back, and on the chest. 
Now, why do people get acne? Again, it's sort of multifactorial, uh, but commonly what happens is these main four things. So we get obstruction or clogging of a pore with dead skin cells and things, which sort of blocks this up at the top. Then we get increased production of sebum or oil in that pore. When that happens and the oil is kind of getting trapped, it helps to sort of feed a normal bacteria that lives on all of our skin called Propionium bacteria acnes. And then eventually all this inflammation in bacteria leads to what's called a follicle rupture where we get a lot of inflammation and that leads to the typical acne spot. Uh, so here's a couple of different pictures of acne. Uh, there's different types of acne types of lesions that you can get. So some people get mostly whiteheads and blackheads, which we can see over here. Uh, some people get the typical, you know, ones you see on TV, those red bumps. Others get spots that sort of ooze and can crust called pustules that are in here. And then some patients get painful cysts or nodules, things that are deep under the skin. Uh, and that's someone we would see back here. It's important to know uh, that acne can scar. So depending on the severity of acne, it's important that you have treatment done sort of uh, at an appropriate time to kind of prevent that. So that's one of our goals in dermatology. Um, so again, we start with our behavioral measures. So we want to use a gentle cleanser or moisturizer. Uh, you want things that are sort of fragrance, perfume free. And one thing you can look for on a label set are the word non-comedogenic. Basically that means it will not clog your pores. And then we have different treatments depending on the type of acne that you have. So for the people that have the whitehead and blackhead type, one common thing that we use is something called a topical retinoid or a vitamin A. That helps to open up the pores and sort of clean out things from underneath. Um, that also can help with things like fine lines, uh, brown discoloration, big pores. So that's another treatment that a lot of people use. Uh, for the ones that get those typical red bumps, there's different things that we can do. Uh, sometimes we use a topical antibiotic to decrease inflammation. It's not used like when you have an infection and you take an antibiotic by mouth. These uh, medications that we have are just to decrease the inflammation that's around there. The ones that are the pustules or have the pus, we also can use the uh, antibiotics to decrease inflammation. But for people with the cysts or the nodules that are starting to scar, we often use um, oral antibiotics or more so the oral retinoids, the isotretinoin like Dr. Pond had mentioned before. And depending on type of acne, we often use a combination of different products to help. Sort of a cousin to acne is another condition called rosacea, which is quite common. Uh, so this is something you may see Dr. Pond for, for the laser, depending on the type that you have. Uh, so rosacea is characterized by redness. Often they have flushing or red pimple-like spots to the central face. One way you can distinguish this from acne is that they don't often have the whitehead and blackhead component. And patients often will say that they have a lot of triggers for their redness. So things that sort of increase blood flow to the skin, spicy food, hot beverages, exercise, stress, that'll make, make the face a little bit more red. And for this, we have typical topical treatments that can help with the blood vessels and the bumps. Uh, some people do go on oral medications to decrease inflammation. And sometimes if there's blood vessels with the hemoglobin chromophore, uh, then you can have laser for that. So these are just some examples of rosacea. So in both cases, you see there's this redness sort of to the central face. And on history, they'll often say they do have those triggers. The next condition we'll talk about is something called psoriasis. So uh, psoriasis is a chronic recurring skin condition that we see uh, in dermatology quite commonly as well. What's different than psoriasis compared to eczema in terms of how it looks is often psoriasis is well-defined or well-circumscribed uh, spots on the skin that often have a very thick scale to it. Sometimes it might look even white or a little bit silvery. And I'll show you some photos of that as well. Uh, often psoriasis does not itch, sometimes it can, but that's one thing that we always ask on history. And that psoriasis often comes on in your 20s or there's another peak sort of in the 40s and 50s, whereas eczema often starts when you are a baby. 
there's a genetic predisposition with psoriasis as well. And as well, in addition to affecting the scalp and nails, psoriasis can also affect the joints. So we always ask our patients about joint pain and sometimes work with a rheumatologist to manage these conditions. Uh, psoriasis can be associated with things like smoking, depression, and obesity. Uh, and there's triggers for flares of psoriasis, such as infection, uh, medications, trauma to the area, like Dr. Pond mentioned, or stress. And some people with uh, psoriasis, as I mentioned, develop arthritis. They're also more prone, these patients, to having things like diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. So these are some photos of psoriasis. So you see this is pretty well defined. You can draw a circle pretty easily around this spot, and it sort of has that white scale to it. Here's another example, pretty well defined, pretty thick white scale. Same thing, these are pretty well defined areas um, involving the scalp here, and this is someone with a bit more generalized psoriasis. Again, for treatments for psoriasis, you know you want to minimize those triggers, minimize things like smoking or alcohol that can flare. Uh, and we also have topical treatments for psoriasis. Uh, There's listed up there, including steroids, vitamin E type creams, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, tar in the past, and salicylic acid, all to try to decrease that thickness of the skin. Because when it boils down to psoriasis is a disorder of an abnormal way that the skin is sort of shedding and prol proliferating. Some patients do require medical light treatment or pills by mouth, and there's also a number of injectable medications that we have for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So the thing we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on now is just sun damage and skin cancer. So it's very important that you protect the skin you're in. As Dr. Shapiro mentioned, the skin is the largest organ of the body, and skin cancer is something that we see very commonly and can have very serious effects on your health and can be deadly. So you really wanna protect yourself from the sun because the sun can cause sunburn, skin cancer, and premature aging. A lot of sun damage that happens to the skin occurs before the age of 18, so it's not unusual that people may have grown up on a farm or by the ocean at a beach and their skin is completely fine until later in life, you know, their 50s, 60s, they start to sprout things up. Uh, that could be reflective of damage back when you were a child. And when we talk about skin um, and the sun, we usually are talking about two types of uh, UV rays. So we talk about UVB, kind of the burning rays you could think of it, which are related to sunburn and skin cancer, as well as to UVA. So UVA penetrates a bit deeper into the skin. So in addition to causing skin cancers, it can also cause premature aging of the skin as well. Um, of course, you'd want to avoid the sun as best you can. We'll talk about some protective strategies shortly, but also avoid the tanning beds at all cost. And there's many types of skin cancers we see in dermatology, but today we're gonna to focus on three types, the basal cell carcinoma, the squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma, which is one of the more deadly types of skin cancer. So this first picture here, we see that we're looking at someone who's pretty fair skin type, and on their nose there's this circle or this papule. If, I'm not sure if everyone can see, but it sort of has a circle and it almost looks like it has a raised ridge or raised border to it with sort of a central indent crater maybe even a little ulcer right in the middle and i'm not sure if you can see in this lighting but there's these little blood vessels that are kind of radiating throughout this spot so that's classically how a basal cell can present there's different types of basal cells but most commonly they present as a spot that sometimes people think is a pimple uh, a bump that's on the face and grows and grows maybe over months or years often has the history it starts to bleed on its own and get a little better bleed again get a little better uh, and this is what classically a basal cell will look like Basal cell skin cancers are the most common skin cancer. They're also the most common cancer worldwide. Uh, and we see them sort of all day long in dermatology. These tumors usually will just sort of grow slowly and slowly over a, a long period of time in the area that they're in. They usually don't spread to other areas of the body, although that can sometimes happen depending on the type and whether it's been there for a very long time. Um, and the usual treatment for this would be to remove the spot. So your dermatologist or plastic surgeon would cut the spot out as well as a little bit of normal tissue to make sure that they've got it all. Uh, then your dermatologist will see you periodically for full skin checks because once you have one skin cancer, you're prone to getting another one. So these are commonly in people that are fair, but they can happen in anyone. 
common in people who have a lot of sun exposure. Uh, we can see them in people who are on immune suppressive medications or have a low immune system, but that type of skin cancer more common in those patients is something called a squamous cell skin cancer. So these spots, if you can look compared to the previous photo, these ones are sort of more of a plaque or more of a spot that you may think, oh, this looks like a little patch of eczema or something of that nature. They often get quite crusty or rough. Uh, they can have bumps and lumps in them as well, but often they sort of become a wound that doesn't heal if they're left for a long time, kind of an open sore. Often these might get a little bit painful. So if you have a spot that you can't remember how you got this cut that you think on your arm, if it's painful, if it's grumbling along, it might be one of these types of skin cancers. Squamous cell skin cancer, there's different types as well, but this does have the potential that it may spread to lymph nodes. So we wanna make sure that we sort of get on top of this one quickly. Uh, and surgery is sort of the main treatment for that as well. Then the next three pictures all on the bottom, they have something in common that they all are brown and they look very nasty. So these are examples of melanoma. So melanoma is one of the most deadly skin cancers that if it's not caught early, uh, it can be deadly as I'd mentioned. But if they're caught early and picked up and managed, you know, people that uh, can do quite well. So it's really important to recognize this type of thing quite early. What usually happens is a patient may have a mole or a spot on their skin that just sort of looks a little bit funny. Often they are very dark like this, although they don't have to be, so any spot that you know is changed or you're worried about should be checked out. But usually they sort of have this a bit asymmetrical sort of appearance to them, multiple colors within it. They can affect any areas where we have pigment in our body. So in addition to the skin, they can come up in the mouth or digestive system and can also happen in the eye because we all have pigment uh, cells in the eye as well. Here's an example of a melanoma under a nail. So if you can see the normal nail has kind of been lost. There's sort of a bump underneath and a whole bunch of the nail is missing. So this is a nail melanoma. And over here is another melanoma where you see there's this sort of brown spot, but around it there's a whole bunch of brown with a little bit of fading. It looks a little bit unusual as well. So those are examples of melanoma. So important things that you can do at home to monitor your own moles, we talk about the A, B, C, D, E's of mole monitoring. So if you look at the left, you see how all these moles, they look kind of boring. They just look like a nice circle. Boring is good in medicine. So if you look at all these, they're just kind of circles. They look completely fine. Probably everybody has lots of these little moles on their body. But if you look at the column on the right hand side, you can see that things look a little bit unusual. So A stands for asymmetry. If you draw a line down all these moles, they look very different on the left to the right. Whereas most of these, you know, we draw a line, they look pretty much the same on both sides. B stands for border. So you see all of these moles are pretty regular, pretty nice circle. But over here, this one is starting to get jagged. All of these, they are no longer sort of a nice little spot. They're kind of a little bit irregular. This one's not showing up as much, but on the screen, it sort of has these areas that are kind of going in and out. Same thing here. This doesn't look like, it just looks a little bit ugly, right? We call it the ugly duckling sign. So if all your body moles look the same and you have one of these, that might be something you want to get checked out. Uh, B is the border, as I mentioned, sort of jagged edges to the mole. And C stands for color. So moles can be dark, but if you have a mole that's changed color, that's become a lot darker, or a mole that has one, maybe two colors in it, that would be something that you should have your doctor check. D stands for diameter. So, you know, in the literature, they say that most skin cancers are greater than six millimeters. That's not always the case, but any mole that you have that's changing in size, bring that up to your doctor. You can get new moles, you know, in puberty, in pregnancy, but it's a bit unusual if you all of a sudden develop sort of a new spot that looks like any of these later in life. And E stands for evolution. So any spots you have that are itchy, painful, bleeding, crusting, anything that has sort of um, symptoms to it would be something we'd recommend you get checked. Um, so these are just to summarize are some of the things that you should see your family doctor who may send you to a dermatologist um, if you have any of these concerns. So something is new and you're unsure. If you notice something on your body that wasn't there and you don't know what it is, it's good to have it checked out. If something has changed color, size, shape, 
anything that's bleeding, crusting, sore, or painful, like I mentioned, and anything that looks different than the rest of your moles, that ugly duckling sign. So we've talked a little bit about skin cancer, um, and with the melanoma, as well as surgery, sometimes patients do need systemic treatments and things, lymph node testing and whatnot, so it can be very serious. Um, the melanoma can spread to internal organs, to the brain, other places in the body, so that's why you want to catch it early. Now to prevent all those things that we just showed you scary photos of, we want to talk a bit about sun protection. So we always recommend first and foremost sun avoidance. So if possible, try to avoid being in the sun between peak hours of about 10 to 2 o'clock and stay in the shade when you are outdoors. Sun protection measures include things like wearing loose, lightweight clothing while you're outside, wearing a wide-brimmed hat to protect the scalp and face, sunglasses, because if you remember, I mentioned there's melanin or pigment cells in the eye, uh, and then, of course, sunscreen, which we'll talk about in detail. Uh, sun protection clothing is something that's recently got a bit more attention in recent years, um, where these are sort of t-shirts and scarves and clothes and things um, that are specifically made to protect you from the sun while you're out and about. So even commonly people may buy uh, driving gloves if they spend a lot of time in the car. They have different, you know, things you can put on your lap while you're driving in the sun, all to protect you. And instead of having an SPF factor, they have something called a UPF factor that talks about protecting uh, you from the sun. So if you see a piece of clothing that has a UPF rating, that means that it's a specific type of sun protective clothing as an added layer of protection. So sunscreen. People have a lot of questions about sunscreen and there's always things coming up in the media about safety of sunscreen and things. Um, so what does a sunscreen do? So there's two basic mechanisms of how a sunscreen can help prevent you from the sun's rays. So some sunscreens, mostly our chemical sunscreen, work by absorbing the UV light and sort of changing it into uh, a lesser energy state. And then other sunscreens basically sit on the top of your skin and reflect the UV light off. Those are more your physical sunscreens or mineral sunscreens. So chemical sunscreens are the absorbers and then our uh, physical sunscreens are the reflectors. And physical sunscreens often include either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide on the label. Now people have questions about absorption of sunscreens and danger and things that they may have read online, but the amount that gets systemically absorbed of a topical sunscreen is quite negligible. A lot of the studies and things that were done about problems with sunscreens were done in rats and in the lab and things, so it's really, you know, important to wear a sunscreen. But if you're someone who doesn't like the chemical idea, doesn't like the feel of a chemical sunscreen, then you can look for those physical blockers with zinc or titanium. They have a bit more of a thicker texture to it. So sometimes they can just be a little, require a little bit more sort of rubbing in, but um, both sort of do a different job or have a different way of handling the sun. So when you're picking a sunscreen, we recommend that you pick a SPF of at least 30. So what is an SPF? SPF is a sun protection factor. So what does SPF 30 mean? Basically what that means is if you apply the appropriate amount of sunscreen from what's on the label, you could stay out in the sun for 30 times longer than you would without anything on your skin before it would turn red. Now not everybody uses the right amount of sunscreen. Some studies show that you know the size of a shot glass is the amount of sunscreen required to cover all the areas. Um, and I can say that probably a lot of people aren't putting that on, uh, but that's kind of what SPF means. SPF of 30 generally blocks about 97% uh, of UV rays, and when they do the testing to give an SPF um, rating, they're testing the UVB rays. So one thing you want to look for is something that's broad spectrum or that says it protects about against both UVA and UVB rays on the bottle. As you remember, B are those burning rays, the sun can or skin cancer rays, and UVA as well as skin cancer are also related to photoaging. So you want to look for a product, um, and the Canadian Dermatology Association has this logo over here. I'm not sure if you can see it, um, but basically if a sunscreen has this logo on it, what that means is that the sunscreen is broad spectrum, it has an SPF greater than 30, it's hypoallergenic, non-comedogenic, so won't clog pores, and usually is minimal or has no perfume to it. 
Um, so one great resource that for anybody who's looking for information on skin conditions or what products to use would be www.dermatology.ca. That is the Canadian Dermatology Association website. So they have a list of, you know, things like moisturizers that are recognized and safe and have been found to be good to use. They have a list that has different sunscreen brands and things to use. They also have information about skin cancers, doing self skin checks, all the other conditions that we see. So again, www.dermatology.ca is a great place to look if you want to get any information. So basically dermatologists see and treat a wide range of conditions affecting the skin, the nails, the hair, and the mucous membranes. Uh, sunscreen, sun protection is very important to prevent skin cancer, uh, which is something that's very common, unfortunately, and can have some serious effects on life. Um, and it's important to keep your eye on your skin. So any moles that are changing, any spots that are new or causing problems, you should have them checked out. And if it's hard for you to check the skin, maybe you have a partner or you can use a mirror and just sort of have a look. Um, so that is it. We are here to help you guys as dermatologists. Uh, and I will conclude with one of my favorite cartoons about sunscreen. Just, you know, I told you to wear your sunscreen. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. So stay up here. Okay. Thank you very much, Brittany. Um, is everybody warm enough or would you like us to turn up the heat a little? Those of you who gave up your cards, you wish you still had them. Uh, I was doing a count and um, based on the number here, I think there are still five people who haven't asked a question. So for those five of you, if you could just raise your hand. Oh, we have some over here. There's some action. Um, just to, thanks very much, Brittany. And please, the speakers can come up and uh, I guess we'll be using these microphones here. Um, and you're supposed to speak directly into the microphone, not into the folder. And Kusi, you're over here. Uh, and uh, we've covered a lot of topics. There's a lot of jargon. Desquamation means scaly. And edema means swelling. And uh, systemic means your whole body. But uh, I think you get the gist of most of these things. Uh, I do want to take the opportunity while we're getting ready for this to uh, thank uh, Monica, who uh, at least that's what she's written down here. I'm supposed to thank her for, uh, I'm, I'm supposed to thank you so much, uh, but I do. Thank you, Monica, for doing this for everybody and for doing it all year here at the end of the uh, eight sessions for uh, this uh, year and a half. Thank you very much for doing that. It means a lot. And, uh, and I'd like to thank Kevin, who's been very patient and uh, working with us on the uh, AV stuff, which was set up beautifully, and the video, et cetera, uh, online. Um, and thank you, Kevin. And thank you for, uh, for coming tonight. As you may have to leave, we're going to spend a few minutes trying to answer questions. Uh, I'll just say some of the questions, there's a lot of questions. There really are. And, and I think they are all good questions. Uh, some need to be folded in with others and some need to be translated. So Monica, I'm hoping we might cover five or six questions really, and that I will take the rest and we will, we will rephrase them succinctly and uh, put up answers. Could you put those online? Would that be available? Yeah? Yeah, so if people want to, um, uh, you know, go in, it would be nice that way to uh, get questions and even people who are at home or wherever they're watching from, um, uh, could also uh, send in uh, questions, and you can visit the website, sunnybrook.ca, for updates. But uh, maybe, Monica, do you want to say a word about that? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can certainly, we can work with our web team and put together a compilation. Of okay, so we're going to work with the web team. Are they spiders? No, they're, <laughs> but we'll work with the web team and, uh, and, uh, and find somebody who can understand web stuff. Yeah, and then... Yeah, and I think we could just put together succinct answers and I'll work with the team here to get answers to the questions because uh, honestly, we really can't cover them all. So I did start off with the question before, uh, what can be done about enlarged pores? Um, can anybody feel confident in taking that? I think you did mention it a bit, didn't you? Um, uh, so there's a couple of things that can be tried. Sometimes if the pore is just one solitary enlarged pore, it may actually be a type of cyst that would need to be removed called the dilated pore of Weiner. But just for every day, if people have oily skin, sort of dilated pores, then using one of those vitamin A creams might help to tighten and get rid of some of the oil. Um, but sort of we don't have a magic uh, treatment, I would say, that would completely eliminate them. Okay. 
Uh, right. So here's a question. This, these were the first two or three handed to me, so, but I thought it was good. And again, it follows on the uh, tanning uh, idea. So Hawaii is banning all sunscreen because it's destroying the coral reef. What is your opinion? Um, my opinion about what? Uh, I think uh, that they, if I understand it, I think it's the benzophenones, but I think it might just be one of the components of the sunscreens, or two of them actually, that's right. And uh, then people could use sunscreens that don't have those two components, but then again, they probably shouldn't be out in the sun in the first place. And if the only reason they're going in the sun is just to kill the coral, then that's not really nice. Um, and obviously, somebody's mad at Hawaii anyways uh, with all these. I think the, the coral are probably looking at the sunscreen and thinking we should have just kept quiet, but I think that volcano is worse. Um, so, and the sunscreens won't protect you from the volcano. They just roll right over you. But I think it's a very, it's an important question. And the, I don't know if it's truly, um, uh, I guess this dilemma is not the right word, but uh, that's a choice between two bad choices. But it is here. It, actually, it is a dilemma. The two bad choices are we have sunscreens that might be killing coral reefs, or we have sun that has skin cancer that's killing people. Uh, depending on who's voting, and the coral reefs don't usually vote, uh, we're looking at the people. So there's actually a lot of lobbying going both ways. Uh, but I think we can probably come up with some sensible, sensible uh, compromise to that. But it's, clear, it's a big issue for the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, and they're actually uh, talking a lot about that. So uh, my opinion is that work needs to be done, and it can. Um, what causes whiteheads? How do you get riv rid of them? And uh, is there something that really works? Who, who, you feel confident enough to talk about whiteheads, Kusi? <laughs> So whiteheads are a part of acne. It's what we call non-inflammatory acne. And so what happens is that the hair follicle is clogged by a bit of keratin, and so it creates a whitehead. One of the best ways to treat whiteheads is to use vitamin A creams, because what they do is that they gently exfoliate the skin and unclog the pore to eliminate the whitehead. OK. Um. I think all of you might want to, well, are skin peels of any, and the word any is underlined, value? Are skin peels of any value? Do, yes or no? It's a pretty simple question. Yes. They are? Okay, skin peels can be a value? Okay. I guess yes. Um, it depends, and there's different degrees, I guess, of how vigorous and how, it could just be a cream that you put on every day that does it over a year, perhaps, or keeps things healthy, and it could be something where you really get quite aggressive with. Uh, anyways, do you do full face like that? That patient that you showed who looked like, like they'd been dragged behind a truck down the highway. <laughs> do, do you do that? You do that, eh? Okay. All right. All right, so those, there's a skin peel. Um, patient has psoriatic skin condition. Is light therapy the last resort? Laura, you do light therapy in your office. And so the word here is, those are the words. Is light therapy the last resort? Uh, first of all, there's no such thing as the last resort. We can always come up with new resorts. Um, and how many times can it be done? And does it cause skin cancer because of the radiation? Good questions. OK, so no, it's not the last resort. I think most people, when we take a history, about 80% of patients with psoriasis will get some improvement. Do you want to move the mic a little closer there? 80% of patients with psoriasis will get improvement with natural sun exposure. So a lot of patients come into my office knowing that already. So uh, it's definitely not the last resort. In our climate, for instance, this time of year, I often tell patients to get sun, uh, like 10 minutes of sunshine two to three times a week, unprotected. Beyond that, they get protected. Because uh, it was talked about before that psoriasis is one of those diseases that can kebnerize or go to areas of trauma. So if you get a bad burn, your psoriasis can really flare. We do have, uh, my office does have phototherapy. They've isolated a wavelength in, ultraviolet, in the UVB spectrum of 311, which is specific to treat skin disease. So the concerns about skin cancer really aren't there anymore. So, and I'd say, you know, it's not a cure for psoriasis, but often can clear it quite nicely. Can often put it into remission for a number of months. It's used in combination with topical therapy for more severe disease can be used in combination with oral therapy. And when patients are quite clear, they may take a break. And then if and when it starts to come back, they certainly can be treated repeatedly. There's really no limit, for, especially for narrow band UVB phototherapy. It's very safe to use. 
So proper light therapy is safe and effective. And it's and it, one of the choices. And for some people, it's magical. Uh, and, and it's probably the only treatment we have that, if you will, gives you a mini cure that you could have a full course of light, which could be 20 treatments, seven weeks, three times a week. So it's 20 treatments. And people could be clear for one year, six years, seven years. Uh, and I don't think we have another treatment like that. Uh, other, other than death, is, the there's other thing I want to specify that, uh, is that it's not the same as tanning beds. Tanning beds emit UVA. They are not safe. They've been linked to melanoma. So when patients said to me, well, I can't come to your office. Is it okay if I just go to the nearest tanning salon? And the short and long answer is no. Okay. Thank you. Is patch testing covered by OHIP? No, actually, it's covered by tape. Um, <laughs> and uh, where do we do it? It's on the back. So, no, patch testing is covered by OHIP. And I would say that uh, it's one of these tests where you really, there are a lot of nuances to patch testing, and you need to have it done not only by an expert, but somebody who has all the patches possible available. You don't want to test somebody for four things on their arm and say, oh, you're fine, there's nothing you're allergic to, when they should really be tested to 104 things. And in North America, there's a North American uh, contact dermatitis group there are only 13 sites in North America, and uh, three are in Canada, and Sunnybrook is one of those sites. So when we do patch testing, we do full-on patch testing, and I feel bad. Uh, we had a man recently in his 30s, had horrible hands, otherwise healthy, red, scaly, miserable, had it for seven years. He came in for patch testing. He was allergic to something called Carbamix, which is in rubber. And I said, well, here's what you're allergic to. Uh, go figure it out. So gave him instructions and he came back a month later. Seven years of this rash, it was gone in a month. And I said, that's oh, he's hugging everybody. I mean, people were walking by with scabies, he was hugging them. But he, he just couldn't, he was so excited because he had his life back. And, and other, he, he thought he had no future. But I said, you know, I wish it's, you should have been patch tested sooner. And he said, I was patch tested. And it was patch tested uh, not by a dermatologist, but he, is, he had about eight patch tests put on put on and they said, you have nothing, which is not appropriate. If you're not going to do it all, then don't do it. Um, but patch testing is covered by OHIP and uh, it's done here at Sunnybrook. Uh, the other sites in Canada, if Sunnybrook's too far for you, you can go to Ottawa or Montreal. So, and if you live in Etobicoke, then I'm sorry you can't, because it's the only place, I have people come from like the New Lister Garden and they don't complain and they drive back. People from Etobicoke say, I can't get there, it's too hard. Um, I don't know why, there's like this moat. Anyway, um, oh, this is a good laser question. I hadn't thought of this one. If a person is diabetic, is it okay to do laser? Will they heal properly? Is there any risk like that? So typically, people who have diabetes are at increased risk of infection and poor healing. So, you know, generally, if people have uncontrolled diabetes, we probably wouldn't recommend laser. Uh, but if their diabetes is well controlled, then I would do it, but with conservative laser settings. Then do you tell them anything special or warn them about anything? Yeah, so I tell them to watch out for any signs of infection. If they get a burn, if the skin Just is that. open, then call the office so we can take a look at it and then manage it properly. So don't hesitate. If something comes up, yeah, exactly. don't wait around. Let you know right away. Yeah. Okay. Um, a treatment available for spider veins and varicose veins. Um, it wasn't me asking that. Just... Uh. Spider veins on the face, I find, respond very well to laser. Uh, leg veins, varicose veins, they're best treated with uh, injection-type therapies or um, other things uh, because you can access the veins better with uh, injections. And then sometimes people have really bad varicose veins, so they might need surgery to remove the, the big varicose veins. So uh, still on a laser theme, and this is a good question, because uh, what about laser for toenail fungus infection? So laser can be used to treat toenail fungus. Um, it's not always 100% successful. It depends on the type of fungus. Uh, so it's best to see your dermatologist, get a nail clipping, have it diagnosed properly, and then go through different treatment options. There's other treatment options, such as there's nail lacquers that have antifungal medications within it that is helpful. There's oral medications. And then there's also laser. So it's good to see your dermatologist and discuss what option might be best for you, depending on what your culture, your toenail culture results show. Can laser make you taller? No. <laughs> that's, that's my question. Okay, can bromine in the pool irritate the skin? 
Anybody know pool, bromine, as opposed to chlorine? I guess you can get bromoderma, but uh, I think if you don't drink the water, you're probably okay, which is a good rule in the pool anyways, because I think most analyses show what about 20, 30% of what's in the pool is urine. And so I think the bromine is the least of your worries. Do you have an answer to that question? Oh, function in the nail, yeah. I, I'm going to repeat it all. Yeah, don't worry. I've done this before. Okay. Okay. So iodine cures uh, fungus at a nail, if you're that lady. And uh, there you go. So it's a, what we call an N of 1 study. Uh, it actually is called that because that's it. So uh, we just need another couple hundred thousand people to do it, and then we'll move to iodine. That reminds me, when I was a kid, we used iodine on us for everything. Right? Yeah. And did you, did you, did you cry when they put it on your nail? or? Yeah, yeah, no, it stings. You, know, you, got, you feel it working, as the Desinex commercial says. You can feel... Yeah, well, you imagine how the fungus felt. Um, so uh, I feel like I'm asking this question. I have freckles on my face and dark spots more and more are appearing. Any way I can get rid of them? Makeup. Is so, another, yeah, so any other ways? Yeah. So when it comes to uh, brown spots on the face, there's lots of different conditions that can be brown. So whether these are brown spots from the sun, there's conditions um, where you just get brown discoloration on the face called melasma. So the first step would be you'd want to see someone to make a diagnosis of what your brown spots are to make sure they're not a skin cancer. And then the main treatment to start with would be the sunscreen. Because if you're going out in the sun and getting a lot of sun exposure, the sun turns the skin brown. So then they'll probably, that might be why you're getting more and more with time. But see your doctor so they can tell you what the brown spot is that you have, and then they can give you the appropriate treatment for it. Thank you. So actually, there's, there's a couple parts to this I want to ask. One is about seborrheic keratosis, and one's about sebaceous hyperplasia. Obviously, they do trouble people. Um, uh, right now, uh, treatments may not be covered uh, under OHIP. Uh, the, the rules of OHIP are stuff is covered or it's not covered. It's not like, oh, it's cosmetic, oh, it's upsetting me. Um, it's just it's covered or it's not covered. And we're lucky because most things are covered, but a lot of things aren't. And, um, uh, and when you think of things that are as common as sebaceous hyperplasia and seborrheic keratosis, and we'll have our speakers explain those, uh, it probably uh, would take enough resources away. Uh, first of all, nobody would do it. So if I'm going to get $2 to treat your 800 seborrheic keratosis, we're not going to do it. We'll say next. Uh, and the second thing is, if we do do it, then when you go in to get your cancer drug, they'll say, I'm sorry, we just ran out of money treating everybody's seborrheic keratosis. So it's not easy making these decisions. I'm sure our next government in Ontario will do a great job. Um, so, uh, seborrheic, I, I'm not running otherwise, but thank you for your vote. Seborrheic keratosis. Uh, so these are the brown spots that look like these greasy ones. I think you saw a few. They're stuck on looking, and uh, they're not cancer. They don't turn into cancer. Uh, Bob Lester, who was uh, the head here many years ago, was a mentor, and he called them the barnacles of life. And I thought that was a great description. They are indeed the barnacles of life. Uh, having said that, most people don't want those barnacles, and uh, we can't treat them, but it can be very challenging. Uh, some drugs have come out, like they look like they might treat it, but um, it would probably cost a lot to buy those drugs too. So companies have sort of moved away thinking nobody would buy them. I think people have a lot probably would buy them. People have hundreds of these on them, on them sometimes. So how do you treat, if somebody comes in with Cibri, Brittany, what do you think about, you're going, you're in practice now, and people have Cibri keratosis. Does it make your data see that? 
You know, they're very common. There's other things that would get me much more excited as a dermatologist. First, you know, you want to see your doctor to diagnose these spots. So basically to make sure they're not a skin cancer. If they don't bother you, you can just leave them alone. You will get more with time. So even if your doctor treats one, this is going to be a lifelong thing. They can be treated with liquid nitrogen or surgical removal, um, but all those have risk and benefits as well to it too. So if they don't bother you, we just recommend to yeah. leave them alone. That's a good summary. I ask you about sebaceous hyperplasia, and then I'm going to come back and ask uh, Lori another question. But Kusi, can you talk about sebaceous hyperplasia? You were describing things that look like little donuts and that, um, but those can also be benign things. They're not all basal cell carcinomas, um, but they have something just as common, sebaceous hyperplasia. So what, what is that? So sebaceous hyperplasia is oil glands in our skin. So we have oil glands on our skin, commonly on the face, the chest, and the back. And in some people, people that tend to have oily prone skin, these oil glands can overgrow. So we call them sebaceous gland hyperplasia. And as alluded to earlier, there are these slightly yellowish bumps that have this kind of lobulated look to it and have a central little indentation. They are 100% Benign. So like Dr. Waller said, you know, if you're concerned, if this is new, changing, or alarms you, see your dermatologist to get it diagnosed. If your dermatologist deems it to be a sebaceous gland hyperplasia, it is benign. It's of no medical concern or consequence. But if they bother you from a cosmetic, aesthetic point of view, sometimes we take um, an electric needle, the cautery needle, and we just cauterize them gently to just shrink them down. It doesn't get rid of them 100%. Uh, so over time, they may grow up again. And so as Dr. Waller said, with seb seborrheic keratosis, it does require some maintenance. Okay, Lori, thank you very much, Kusi. Um, where's the one for Lori? Oh, here it is. Th this is probably your favorite consult on a Friday afternoon, 8.30. Person's itching all over, has no rash. Um, what is itching without a rash? Is that 8.30 a.m. or 8.30 p.m.? 8.30 8 p.m. <laughs> so um, when, when people complain of itch, that's sort of one of the distinguishing things that dermatologists do. Is it itchy and you have a rash, or do you look at your skin, there's nothing to see? So when there's nothing to see, there are, we tend to do some screening because there are certain conditions about 10% of the time, internal conditions like thyroid disease, potentially lymphoma, that can cause the systemic complaint of itching. So we tend to do some laboratory screening for that. And then on the other side is trying to give patients some relief. So a, a part of the strategy in, in giving relief is going to depend on how badly people are itching. So it may be using antihistamines, either over the counter or prescription, topical steroids, emollients. Sometimes I use phototherapy in my office, can be very effective for controlling itch. And then uh, there are layers of drugs that we can add on depending on, uh, you know, guided by symptoms. And sometimes we just don't get an answer and it's very challenging. Uh, and sometimes we do. Um, but there's a question then in here, I lost the card, but it's, it's in here about uh, somebody who has diabetes and uh, itchy skin. Um, uh, light therapy isn't working. Uh, what can we do about that if it is a diabetic with itchy skin? I mean, I guess, I mean, generally when people are itchy, I, we, Dr. Waller talked about some general measures, almost like for eczema skin. You want to optimize the skin. So dry skin tends to itch more. So we talk about brief showers, warm showers instead of hot, patting yourself dry. That's the best time to put on emollient. I usually counsel for fragrance-free laundry detergent like Tide Free. We hate fabric softeners. Dermatologists, very drying. Skin's dry, tends to itch more. So I often recommend a quarter cup of vinegar in the rinse cycle of the wash. Um, and again, with diabetic, I mean, sometimes you can use oral agents as well, to, like antihistamines to control itching. With a diabetic, sometimes abnormal kidney disease can make you more prone to itching. So diabetics are more prone to kidney, uh, kidney dysfunction. So it, it makes sense to make sure that that's being followed and somebody's looking into that, because that may explain why all of a sudden you're becoming itchy. Yeah, and we heard about avoiding things like dryer pads and things like that. For some people, they may not have had a problem before, but suddenly they do. Uh, even uh, laundry detergents, which you may have been you know, told are safe, uh, but uh, then you, you move or your water hardness changes, uh, it actually changes the molecular components going on there and some people become itchy when they move to a new house and they think they're allergic to the house, but they're not. They're just, it's, it's the way the water changed and it could be tricky to sort out. Um, itching is a problem. People, 
the, the worst thing we hear is people are getting itchy, 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 no matter what you do. And the greatest thing we hear, which I heard today, uh, was a, a husband and wife who are not itchy anymore and are very happy. And if you want to have, you know, emollient put on, it's good to have somebody you like put it on for you. Um, there's a very succinct question here. I think it's a question about relationship between anxiety and rash. And uh, I will tell you uh, to myself, because there have been legal cases I've been involved with, there's a lot of literature uh, showing that with increased stress, it could be a lot of things that increase, we all have stress all the time, but with increased stress, uh, people do get uh, worse rashes. So if, it's usually the inflammatory rashes. It's not like your cancer is going to go crazy. It's more like your itch is going crazy, your eczema is going crazy, more likely to have hair loss. All these things are very well documented. And I don't think we understand it completely, but the stress responses are very powerful and have a huge impact, especially on the skin. Uh, and, and so we see that a lot. And it isn't just an excuse if we say that, we really mean it. Um, one of the diseases that uh, is mentioned in all of this is lichen planus, and I'll just say briefly, so there's any advances in the treatment of lichen planus. I think the answer is in two parts. The, the easy answer is no. Uh, and the better answer is we do have treatments for that, and we are treating a lot of oral uh, lichen planus, lichen planus at a scalp. Uh, to that end, um, I've spent two years convincing a company to do a study, and uh, if we make it, uh, if we all live long enough to deal with the uh, minor disputes between the research uh, ethics board and the company, we might actually get to do this study here in our dentistry area for the oral lichen planus. It's a huge area. If you don't know, lichen planus is an inflammation that can involve the skin, and they usually people have little purple bumps that are itchy, but the stuff we're really interested in is the scarring stuff. If it gets in, if it's in your mouth and goes down into your food pipe, you know, that area scars, people uh, get very ill, it can affect the genitals horribly, people get their scalp scarred, they lose their hair, you can have it involve the eyes, and it's a very um, sort of sadly ignored uh, disease uh, that even in our teaching I don't think we cover well. So thank you for writing that. I didn't write that question, but I wish I did. Um, let me see what I... Do you want to do this? Do you want to come up and uh, run this meeting? No, I'm used to being heckled. It's okay. I feel like I'm at home. Yeah. Well, that's another thing. So actually, I have a seat, and I'll talk about alopecia. If you promise to have a seat. I can tell you the success. Was iodine? Yeah. What if she promises a Sunnybrook fixed it. Hallelujah. OK. You got it. My arms are up. I'm happy about that one. That's one nothing for Sunnybrook. Um, alopecia is, is the technical term for hair loss. and. Uh, it's a devastating condition, and right now, we, we had a, a, an alopecia areata clinic where it's the immune loss of hair, and um, there are many reasons we and eventually phased that out, and now people are treating themselves at home uh, with the kinds of treatments we were using if they need. There are new drugs coming that look very promising for that type of hair loss, and uh, I'm very fortunate now to have a fellow with us. Uh, she joined us as somebody who's a dermatologist from uh, Tokyo who uh, is an expert, a world expert in hair loss, and we've been using some of the technology that has been developed in the Research Institute here uh, with imaging using ultrasound to follow uh, whether it's drug-induced or whether it just came up for no reason. And we always have, have a few publications and hopefully a grant coming to do more. So we're very interested in trying to uh, manage hair loss uh, more effectively. It's a huge impact on people. I, I see the time is... Uh, time to come to the conclusion of our Q&A. So I want to thank the incredible speakers for their great presentations. Thank you. And just a few housekeeping items that uh, recognize the importance of learning from this. We have a weekly Sunnybrook blog. I love that word, blog, uh, called the Personal Health Navigator. It's written by uh, Paul Taylor. Uh, who's a, a former journalist but is doing wonderful work here. And you'll see if you go to the opening page of Sunnybrook, you'll see a story he wrote recently on rate MD and what that really means. And it's a very good reading because uh, Joel DeCoven in our uh, division really started him on this. And he learned a lot about it. He's written a very nice uh, paper article on it. And you can send your questions if you have to ask Paul. That's one word, ask Paul, P-A-U-L. Oh, there he is at uh, sunnybrook.ca. Thank you. 
And uh, be sure to hand in your evaluation forms on the way out, and your reward is that you'll get a free parking voucher. Uh, you cannot use it in a Monopoly game to go to free parking. You can try, but I don't think it'll work. But it could, it could be nice to have. And thank you again for joining us, and thank you all for speaking. And Tom, thanks for being here and making this happen.